Recently, a large-scale law enforcement action targeting defaulting debtors is fervently taking place all over China. The protagonist of this action aren't those who owe a large amount of money. Instead, these are individuals such as someone who owes 55,000 yuan due to a private lending dispute, and another who owes a mere 70,000 yuan. This is a fresh law enforcement action sparked by the new draft of the Civil Compulsory Execution Law. This new regulation grants the court a significant power, summoning defaulters who must attend the investigation. However, if they choose to shirk their responsibilities, ignoring the court summons and refusing to attend, law enforcement will intervene, forcing their attendance. Imagine in the past, debtors might be sued for usury institutions or powerful creditors, but they would sometimes ignore the court summons or fail to attend the trial for various reasons. Such situations leave the court unable to judge whether they truly have the ability to repay their debts. So the court would often assume they are capable of repayment, slapping them with the label of defaulters. We often see examples of this on various social media platforms and websites where even people who owe amounts not exceeding 10 or 20,000 end up on the defaulters list, mostly because they fail to attend the court and later due to poverty couldn't repay their debts. Now the new draft of the compulsory execution law aims to change this situation. They hope to get every debtor to attend the court, allowing the court to understand their circumstances better. But this process doesn't always go as planned. Some debtors might exploit their network of connections to avoid court summons, thereby preventing their arrest by law enforcement. As a result, those who end up arrested are usually those at the bottom of society without any connections. Traditionally in China, owing money to other is akin to killing one's parents, and the vast majority would do their utmost to fulfill their obligation to repay their debts. However, modern China faces a thorny issue. Debtors about to face court who generally owe less than 100,000 yuan, yet the police force mobilized to arrest these people. Their detention and living cost might exceed the debts they owe. Plus, whether they can actually repay their debts remain a big question. Even if they manage to reclaim part of the debt, the money would be returned to the creditors, not to the Chinese government. It begs the question, what exactly is prompting the Chinese Communist Party to fervently pursue these small debts? If we look closely, we'll find some worrying facts behind this. According to statistics, China has 800 million people with debt. Even if only 10% of them can't pay back on their loans, that's 80 million people. Add that to the existing 26.7 million defaulters, it's over 100 million people. If each person on average owes 100,000 yuan, then the total debt amount would reach 10 trillion yuan. If these can't be repaid, it would be 10 trillion yuan of bad debt, enough to shake China's financial system. Facing the situation, the Chinese government has obviously chosen to take action. They want to increase societal trust and uphold social justice by dealing with defaulters severely. However, this can't conceal the limitations of current Chinese laws in adapting to the socialist market economy. For instance, China's bankruptcy law only applies to companies. Ordinary citizens does not have bankruptcy protection, causing a debt trap for those unable to repay the debts. Without bankruptcy protection, these debtors won't be able to raise funds to get back on their feet as their rights to take high-speed trains and flights are restricted. They might even lose opportunities to find work and repay their debts. Such an outcome will only make the debtors live harder, unable to repay their debts and thus leading to doubts about the credibility and reputation of those in power. At this moment, if we delve deep into the lives of the lowest stratum of China, we can see deep social disparity. The wealth gap widens, with wealth circulating among a few approximately 900 million people and less than 2,000 yuan a month among which 600 million earn less than 1,000 yuan. In this context, those with a bit of assets can only buy their own houses through loans, and when the economic situation worsens, the property market falls, income decreases, they struggle to repay loans, life pressure increases, and social pressure correspondingly rises. In a country deeply mirrored in debt, 
the ruling party struggles to navigate through the mounting debts and social pressures. They not only have to extinguish the igniting fuses of debt, but also soothe the citizens trapped in the debt whirlpool to prevent social unrest. However, their chosen method, arresting and prosecuting debtors, forcing their relatives to pay off the debts, only intensifies social resistance. With the push of the international financial market, a fire is lit and spread, putting the Chinese Communist Party under enormous pressure of annihilation. However, these pressures did not come out of the blue. They are the bitter fruits of their own policies. Rulers implemented farming policies in rural areas, promoted the concept of buying houses to the public, advocated internet financial products and credit cards, and even called on the public to start businesses. But under the changing policies and shaky economic situation, batches of people have fallen into the debt trap. From rural areas, cities, entrepreneurs, and even common people deceived by scams becoming the protagonist of this tragedy. For example, around 2010, when the Communist Party promoted animal husbandry to farmers, many farmers borrowed money to build pig houses and cow sheds. However, only four or five years later, the state introduced new policies in the name of environmental protection and forcibly demolished these farms. The farmers who invested a lot of money and effort faced the policy's reversals, not only suffering serious investment losses, but also unable to bear the heavy debt. Looking at the cities, the public's demand for real estate is also driven by many factors. In the past, houses were allocated by each workplace for the employees, but now they are purchased by individuals. Their children need to go to good schools, so the demand for school district properties increases. Sons need to get married, and they need to prepare for a marriage home. All these require a lot of money. The high land transfer fees imposed by the government keep housing prices high, forcing ordinary people to carry heavy debts. In recent years, internet financial products and credit cards have been shaped as the new financial trend in China. However, the economy is unpredictable. When the economy starts to decline, housing prices start to fall and the stock market starts to fluctuate. Many credit card borrowers fall into a debt predicament. In the 2015 Mass Entrepreneurship and Innovation Campaign, up to 80% of entrepreneurs and over 95% of student entrepreneurs failed. They bear huge debts with the Chinese government that initiated the campaigns refused all responsibility and assistance. Fraud is rampant in China and many ordinary people are deceived and unable to repay their debts. This is undoubtedly the blame of loopholes in the management system, the lack of law enforcement and even the collusion of some insiders and fraudsters. In some cases, debtors do not even know they're in debt. For example, villagers whose names were used by government departments to launch mortgage loans or employees whose ID was used by real estate companies to apply for mortgage loans. They are innocent bystanders caught in a vortex. Once these projects have problems, they may become discredited enforced subjects. Some people were tempted to overspend on online loans or overly rely on credit cards to sustain their lives after the epidemic. Their debts accumulated like a snowball. This is not entirely their personal problem. Social consumer attitudes and the luxurious social trends brought by the wealthy also play a role in this process. Behind this debt storm, the puppeteer of all this is a policy of the Chinese Communist Party. However, due to the CCP's information control and incitement of the peoples against each other to this day, the dispute between debtors and creditors continue and the real source CCP's policy has not been deeply explored and reflected on. In this endless debt drama, some people choose to stand on the sidelines, leaving the CCP alone to face its bitter fruits. Before leaving the country, they cashed out all their credit cards, then took these tens of thousands of dollars in US dollars, went to Western countries for policy asylum and left the troubles of debt to the CCP. When we turn our heads to look at the economic pressure of the Chinese government, the situation is not optimistic. Although the official number of defaulters is 26.7 million, the actual number of people who owe debts is definitely much higher than this number. Data in May this year shows just the number of credit and defaulters has exceeded 300 million. 
If all individual defaulters are counted, the total amount of arrears may be staggering. A conservative estimate of over ten trillion. Faced with such a debt crisis, the government chooses to intervene fully, arrest debtors, and recover these debts. Not only has the Chinese government restricted the consumption of those who have defaulted on their debts, but they have also publicized their names and photos in public places and even on social media. This practice may be suspected of violating privacy, but the government seems to have disregarded this because they need money. If debtors continue to ignore their debts, the government may take more severe measures, such as detainment or sentencing. Meanwhile, the financial situation of local government is on the brink of collapse. Shockingly, 480 local governments have recently been labelled as defaulters, most of which are below the county level. Their reason for owing money vary, but mainly because they owe contractors. What's worrying is that this has happened in just five months. If this trend continues, the number of defaulting local governments may exceed a thousand in a year. What's even more worrying is that the potential bad debts of local governments are enormous, estimated to be at least forty trillion yuan. In order to repay old debts, funds for new infrastructure projects have been diverted, and even provincial governments have begun to tap into social security funds. Although this has plugged some of the financial loopholes, the non-performing loan rates in real estate industry has still increased significantly by sixty percent in the past year. In addition, there is a general default on loans by urban investment platforms. Therefore, the entire bank industry in China, whether state-owned banks or commercial bank, is at great financial risk. Let us take you into a real-life version of a movie. As the curtain rises on the debts of governments and businesses, we can't help but imagine a series of staggering scenarios. Imagine. Will those government officials who owe huge debts to be restricted from consumption like ordinary people, even facing detainment? Will there be a day when the town mayor can't take a plane or the city mayor can't dine in a restaurant during a work trip? Could these shocking scenarios really become a reality? We can't foresee the future, but we can see the present. The fiscal embarrassment of local governments is becoming increasingly evident. We see an increase in fines by urban management law enforcement departments, rising water and electricity costs, and an increase in vehicle annual inspection fees and tolls. These are all signs of local government raising funds by unconventional means and symptoms of their financial difficulties. Currently, China's economic model, steeped in debt, relying on large-scale infrastructure and real estate investment, is clearly unsustainable. China is trying to shift from non-productive investment to productive investment, such as high-tech industries. But moving a large amount of investment to relatively small areas is a daunting task. Although China is striving to develop industries such as the chip industry and artificial intelligence, success is still far away. If these non-productive investments are to be shifted to consumption, then the proportion of household consumption in GDP needs to increase by at least ten to fifteen percent points. This will undoubtedly sacrifice the interests of local governments. And trying to replace these non-productive investments with trade surpluses is also unworkable, as the West's purchases of Chinese products are now decreasing. Mainstream economists speculate that China will continue to stick to its current strategy of relying on infrastructure and real estate investment, but this can only be maintained for a while. Ultimately, China must reduce non-productive investment, but no other variable alternative strategy can be found. Under these circumstances, China may fall into long-term economic sluggishness and may even enter a medium to long-term economic recession. In this scenario, we will witness together what change will happen in China. This is an unknown challenge and a reality that we all must face. Before this video ends, if you are interested in this topic, don't forget to share this video, subscribe to our channel, and like our video.